Okay, great. Okay, morning everybody again. So I um, streamlined this monoclonal antibody talk on COVID-19 in primary care. Um, Dr. O'Keefe asked me to keep it focused with primary to primary care, which um, is obviously the most relevant audience here. So what are mon monoclonal antibodies to um, SARS-CoV-2? So monoclonal antibodies are neutralizing antibodies. Typically they're IgG1 class. They're created in the lab laboratory. So the way, they, the way they're derived is from the B cells of patients who've recovered from an infection, in this case, um, COVID-19, or they can be um, humanized mice in the lab, can be immunized with the antigen of interest. And a combination of a mouse and the human B cell immunoglobulin heavy chains and light chains based on their conformations um, and their ability to attach to the antigen, uh, the best combinations are selected and libraries of these monoclonal antibodies are then created in the lab and tested against um, um, the viruses, uh, in this case, just SARS-CoV-2, and the most potent antibodies are then selected. The potency is basically based on the concentration of the antibody that's needed to prevent infection of tissue culture cells uh, with SARS-CoV-2. So usually, um, you know, that narrows down to just a handful of antibodies after thousands and thousands are tested in the lab for neutralization assays. So why are monoclonal antibodies important for COVID-19? They could be a treatment for COVID-19. They may be able to provide immediate protection for those who are exposed and not yet vaccinated. They may be able to serve as another prevention option in addition to a vaccine. And maybe it'll be required for people who can't develop or maintain an adequate immune response after vaccines such as older adults or persons with immunocompromised conditions. This is similar to, um, for instance, um, tetanus immune globulin. Um, as you very well know, tetanus immune globulin is indicated to immediately prevent um, a uh, tetanus prone wound, wound um, to develop into infection and, and a lead infection. So basically monoclonal antibodies are very similar to IgG preparations that we currently use. For instance, we use hepatitis B IgG prophylaxis after a needle stick. It's just that now we have the immunology and the tools to create something very targeted to a specific part of the virus um, in the laboratory, whereas IgG, as you know, is a plasma-derived product and could have uh, a variety of immune globulins, not only for the pathogen of interest, but what uh, whatever is in the pool, not only, let's say, the tetanus, mumps, measles, everything comes in an IgG preparation. Um, versus monoclonals are very targeted to a specific epitope on the virus. So um, here I just want to point out that there are a variety of different monoclonals that are used in clinical settings. So the ones I think that we're most familiar with are the MABs that are used for cancer and autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid lupus, um, where they target an antigen on the host cell. So for instance, rituximab binds CD20 on the B cells and also certain types of cancer cells. Because it, it um, inactivates B cells by binding the B cell, the receptor, there is unintentional loss of healthy host immune cells and thus a myriad of immune immunocompromised um, status and complications that come uh, with that type, with those types of treatments. And also we know that the cancer or autoimmune monoclonals could lead to severe side effects because they're targeting the self, the antigen on, on human cells. So they could lead to flu-like symptoms, um, CHF, inflammatory lung diseases, capillary leak syndromes, and cytokine release syndrome where there could be fever, nausea, and uh, low blood pressure shortness of breath. So more serious complications can be seen 
with the monoclonals targeted to the immune cells. Whereas the monoclonals targeted to viruses and bac bacteria, I don't think most of us have used that unless perhaps you are a pediatrician. There is only one monoclonal that's licensed to be used in, in infants for prevention of RSV called palivizumab. Um, so um, there are recently monoclonals the, that are licensed, for instance, for Ebola, anthrax, and C. diff. The Ebola one is as recent as just a few days ago. So I think you'll be seeing more of these um, um, as more and more monoclonals are going to be licensed for infectious diseases. So when it comes to COVID, um, so just to kind of briefly show you the uh, virus, it's an enveloped single-stranded RNA virus. And uh, its most prominent protein is the spike protein shown here. And there are other proteins as well, the envelope protein matrix and the nucleocapsid protein. So currently where the field is that the majority, almost all the monoclonals actually, I should say, that are being developed for COVID are being targeted to the receptor binding domain on the spike protein of the SARS coronavirus. And we know that now we know that the spike protein binds to the ACE, um, allows the virus to bind with the ACE2 receptor on human cells. But um, with COVID though, there are also other monoclonals that are targeting and modulating the immune response. Uh, we've all heard a lot about the intense immune response that's uh, that occurs with COVID infection. So there are monoclonal um, antibodies that are now being developed for um, anti-IL-6 to anti-terminal complement pathway monoclonals, hu anti-human GMCSF, and JAK inhibitors, which is baricitinib, one of the um, studies that's going on in the hospital with baricitinib. So there is a variety of monoclonal studies that are almost like, a, I would have to say, a dizzying array. But I'm limiting my talk to the monoclonals that will probably hit primary care. So let me take you to those monoclonals. So these, uh, this is a, um, a schematic of, a, of two monoclonal clonal antibodies developed by Regeneron. The, uh, this is the receptor binding domain of the spike protein and their monoclonal 10933 binds to um, one side, I guess, if you will, of the protein, and another monoclonal binds to the other side of the protein, um, just recently published in Science. And here is a, uh, a facility that is manufacturing monoclonals uh, being developed also by Eli Lilly Company. So I'm just going to focus on those two monoclonals because those are most likely the ones that are going to um, come to the primary care area. So, um, so here are a list of the studies that are ongoing for ambulatory patients with monoclonal. So the active two study is actually a master protocol that's studying the Lilly monoclonal uh, that is designed to seamlessly enter phases one, two, and three. Uh, it's a collaboration between the NIH and um, um, and the companies, these active studies, that's, um, that's what they are. And the companies themselves are also doing their separate studies apart from the NIH and hence a lot of confusion about all the different studies that are out there. So the Lilly study, there's a study called Blaze One study. I'll show you the results in, in just a minute. It's a monoclonal that's administered IV. The Blaze Two Lilly study, is one that's ongoing. So this is a very interesting study design where it's intended to uh, prevent COVID in a nursing home. So when the nursing home here has a first uh, case, so we call it the index case of a COVID uh, positive test on a resident, then a mobile research unit is deployed uh, and it's complete with a, a sub-investigator with a um, clinical coordinator, a pharmacist, um, and other staff to set up a infusion 
facility in the nursing home, an infusion room, I would say, in the nursing home and enroll as many residents and staff within the seven days of the positive index case and administer a the Lilly monoclonal antibody shown here, CoV-555. It's a single infusion. That study is, um, is activated in Georgia, but we don't have yet a mobile unit deployed. And I'm um, the PI along with Dr. O in geriatrics, who's gonna be the sub-investigator. Um, another study that I'm involved in that's also open and not, um, but um, actively enrolling is the Regeneron monoclonal antibodies. The two antibodies that I just showed you that bind on either sides of the receptor binding domain. There is a treatment trial, which uh, we're not, I'm not involved with, but the prevention trial is um, intended for household contacts of an index case. So again, this is prevention of COVID in a household. So what, when an index case in a household is identified within four days of that index case testing positive, as many members of the household are, are being asked to participate in the study to receive a subcutaneous injection of the Regeneron combination monoclonals uh, 10933 and 10987. So the difficulty with this study has been the short time window that we have between identifying the index case and the um, household contacts and bring them in the clinic to Hope Clinic and give the subcutaneous injection all within four days. So that's been pretty challenging. So just, uh, sorry, just the one, I'll mention one um, study in the hospital, which is the uh, remdesivir plus the Lilly antibody studies uh, with, um, with the, um, MEPI is shown here, uh, but this study, study currently is on a safety pause. Not so much because the antibodies had a safety issue. It's, it's, that in the, it's just that the difference in the treatment and the placebo groups, there have been outcome differences. But as you very well know, the patients um, that are enrolled in the studies in the hospital have multiple comorbidities and a um, a pause is being held just to have a thorough review of, of the patient baseline conditions. Again, not because of the antibody. So um, this is a very busy slide, but Regeneron had two, um, well, one announcement just a couple of weeks ago of, um, let me minimize this, okay. So this was a study, if you hear all these, you know, different, I guess announcements, there are quite a few announcements that are being released on the news with regards to the monoclonal antibodies. In a way, they're you know, a way ahead of vaccine studies because we know the efficacy um, within a month. So most of these monoclonal antibodies have a half-life of 14 days and the study endpoints are, um, are at day 29. So if an infection is prevented, or whatever the endpoint is, is studied within a month of administering the um, study drug, which leads to these results that are available um, on a, a fast track basis, if you will. So the Regeneron results, they, had, they studied 275 patients and randomized them one-to-one -to, -one to what they call a high dose, a low dose, and a placebo. And then they prospectively characterized the patients as having, so this was an ambulatory study again, as having ser as seropositive, seronegative, or unable to determine the serology. So they found that patients who had high baseline viral loads had greater reduction in viral load at day seven with the combination antibody uh, treatment of Regeneron. And you can see the various details up to 99% reduction at 10, if they had 10 to the seven copies, these are viral loads measured in the nasal swabs. Or if patients who were zero negative had a high baseline viral load, they had greater benefits in terms of symptom alleviation. 
So among zero negative patients, median time to symptom alleviation was 13 days in the placebo compared to as few as six days in the low dose and eight days in the high dose. And there were also more importantly, I think this is an important feature in the primary care setting is who will um, need to be hospitalized. So again, in the zero negative group, 15% of the placebo treated patients were hospitalized compared with um, between five and 7%. So half as many patients um, or twice as many patients in the placebo group were hospitalized compared to the treatment group. And both the doses were well, well tolerated. Um, serious adverse events occurred in two placebo patients when one low dose. And I don't know what they are because this is again, just a press release, it's not published, uh, but I can guess what they might be based on my experience and I'll go over what potential adverse events could occur to monoclonals. Okay, let's see. All right, so should P primary care docs expect to see monoclonals as a treatment of COVID-19 infection? So my answer to that is probably yes. Clinical trials are ongoing. I just showed you the result of one of them. Uh, both Eli Lilly and Regeneron applied for an emergency use authorization for treatment of COVID-19 based on that one trial. And I'll show you the Lilly trial in a minute. Um, so some scenarios as to what type of treatment settings one would need to, um, I guess, have in the, as of, um, uh, in the primary care setting. So the Lilly antibody is given as an IV infusion. The Regeneron antibodies were given as subcutaneous inf infusions, but multiple subcutaneous infusions up to four um, participants had a choice of either um, uh, the thigh or the abdomen as, um, as an injection site. So that's, that's what I anticipate is either IV or subcutaneous infusions. So the side effect profile of what uh, monoclonal antibodies of, of what I've seen in my experience we actually completed an HIV monoclonal antibody study that was ongoing for the past five years in multiple countries across the world where we enrolled 4,500 people um, in monoclonal antibody for HIV prevention. And, I, and the monoclonal antibody was targeted to the CD4 binding region on the virus. So from that experience, I can, um, speak that the side effects were very minimal. I would, uh, about 2% of the patients had um, urticarial um, type rashes. So there's always, um, a, um, you know, some portion of the patients will develop local injection or infusion related side effects such as pain, tenderness, erythema, induration, that's very, very much expected, especially for a sub-Q injection. Um, but some patients may also develop fever, fatigue, myalgias, nausea, vomiting, and rashes. They may also develop um, hypersensitivity such as anaphylaxis, angioedema, um, chest pains, seizures, hopefully not, and hypotension. One um, potential complication of monoclonals in general are anti-drug antibodies. So the immune system could make an immune, uh, a antibody to the antibody itself. And that's mon that will be monitored in all these co COVID studies, as well as in the um, HIV monoclonal study that I described and we did not see any, but it doesn't mean you know, that it, it will, won't happen. And another concern that the field has in general for any monoclonals against infectious disease pathogens is antibody mediated enhancement. So that would be uh, similar to let's say a dengue infection. You may be aware that if a person has uh, dengue, the primary episode followed by a secondary episode um, later on, they may have 
developed antibodies to dengue that are not neutralizing and would cross react with the next serotype of dengue that if they had acquired the next serotype. And it's these cross reactive non neutralizing antibodies that appear to be causing this antibody mediated enhancement where that person would then develop a much more serious dengue infection uh, with a second episode of infection. So there is always, uh, there is a concern about that, but again, these studies are, um, these clinical trials are so early and nothing's been noted um, with regards to antibody mediated enhancement with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So as far as I know, none of this is published. The side effect profile seems acceptable. Um, and both the companies, again, applied for an emergency use authorization. Um, so in terms of what types of patients maybe um, would be eligible or would be, um, um, would be good candidates for monoclonal antibody treatments in the primary care setting, so it would be people who've recently been diagnosed with the COVID-19 illness. So in these studies, in the Lilly study, they took people who had an infection in the last three days or in the last seven days in the Regeneron study. But in general, trial participants were excluded if they had any serious concomitant systemic disease in the opinion of the investigator that would preclude participation or if they were participating in other studies such as a COVID vaccine or if they were pregnant. So that leaves a lot of room for interpretation as to who would be eligible or who would benefit the most. So I think uh, some of that will be guided by the EUA that the FDA will issue if they issue an EUA. Um, but in the future, if the household contact study is successful, then um, even household members could be um, this is, could be um, candidates for the treatment and also pediatric trials are underway. So imagine with the household situation, this is similar to the Tamiflu, when someone, um, you're very familiar with, um, with uh, dispensing Tamiflu for not only someone who's infected with influenza, um, really the most benefit in the four, first 48 hours of the illness, but the household contacts of the index case of influenza are also um, eligible to receive Tamiflu as prophylaxis. So obviously these monoclonals are not as um, simple as, as taking a, um, um, a pill or something oral. Currently they're an IV or subcutaneous infusion. So clearly much more complicated. So, um, so what uh, the, the COVID-19 studies at the Emory Hope Clinic, I talked about the household contact study. Uh, we also just completed, almost completed Moderna vaccine study. And if anyone's interested in participating in the vaccine studies, the best way to do that is to visit the website, the Coronavirus Prevention Trial Prevention Network where it asks a series of questions that leads you to um, the correct study. But we're also doing, Dr. O'Keefe has been helping us quite a bit with, um, with the natural history studies with COVID immune. We, I call one of them COVID immune memory. So we're following ambulatory and hospitalized patients for two years and we're assessing a comprehensive B cell and T cell immunity in depth of the whole um, 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 array of the immunologies, the memory B cells, the immune globulins, IgG, IgM, all the um, T cell responses, CD4, CD8, in collaboration with Rafi Ahmed at the Vaccine Center. And we have quite a few immunological visits for those patients as shown here. And then we also have acutely infected patients um, well, acutely infected or previously infected patients are eligible for this study. And then here are some um, um, contact um, 
information for the HOPE Clinic studies, our website, we have the hope.community at emory.edu email. And of course, directly email me if you are interested or if you have someone who are interested in these studies. Um, I think that's the last slide. And again, I wanna thank Dr. Jim O'Keefe who's been really, really helpful uh, in um, facilitating and, and referring the ambulatory patients to these studies. And, and I look forward to collaborating with him for the monoclonals studies as well as we look at the household contacts in the ambulatory setting. Um, that's it for my, for my talk this morning. <laughs>